Well, if I can invite you back to your chairs so that I can introduce our guest speaker this morning. We had a marvelous time yesterday in the men's breakfast, primarily benefiting from Jared's teaching, although the food wasn't bad either, so we we benefited spiritually and physically as well. So thank you all to the men who were able to make it out to that. We will make those recordings available to the entire church, and we would strongly encourage uh, everyone those who weren't there, guys and, and ladies as well, to listen to those. They weren't uh, they weren't male directed, if I can use that phrase. They they were very general messages that would apply to anyone really, and and they were particularly anointed. Uh, we felt yesterday, and both Aaron and I were thinking afterwards. Well, we we just have to have everyone in the church listen to this, which isn't surprising because Jared Mellinger is someone that both Aaron and I deeply respect because of his preaching gifts. And more than that, because of his friendship to our church and to all of our family of churches, and more than that, because of his godly character, his humility, his passion for the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2, Paul is speaking to the Philippian church, and he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. They all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not Paul, and Jared isn't Timothy, if anything would be appropriate to say the other way around, uh, but I can identify with Paul's gratefulness for a man that is full of affection and a desire to serve not only those in his own local church or his close friends, but those all around the world with the gospel. That's something that I've been grateful for in Jared for many years now. Jared is the senior pastor of Covenant Fellowship Church outside of Philadelphia. Uh, he's been a friend for years now, and he's part of our family of churches. And I don't know of anyone uh, who has the same zeal and passion and affection for our family of churches, or at least no one more than Jared. So Jared has a genuine concern for your welfare, even though you've never met him. And even though you're far, far away from where he pastors week by week, he cares about you. He cares about this church. He cares about our family of churches. And I find myself indebted to him for that. It's such a gift as a pastor to know that there's other pastors that care about your church. It gives you such a sense of uh, comradeship and partnership in the gospel. And so because of that, and also because God has blessed him with a unique preaching gift, I've been so excited to let him preach to you this morning. So if we can welcome Jared as he comes to preach to us. That was a very kind introduction, and it is my simple desire uh, to impart some grace and some good to you here today. It really is a joy to be here. One of the surprises, uh, the unexpected parts of this visit here has been how refreshing this time has been for my soul um, through the hospitality and the prayers and the fellowship uh, and the encouragement that I have received. I've been able to stay with my friends, uh, Stan and Judy Boulay, who are the best hosts in the world. And they nailed all of my favorites and have the place stocked with them. And uh, so that in and of itself has been amazing. Uh, yesterday, as we gathered as men, uh, the men of the church, you brothers gathered around me and prayed for me uh, and prayed for my family and prayed for my youngest daughter, Agatha, who I shared with the guys there, uh, was this summer diagnosed with cancer. And I can't tell you how much it means to me to know that there are 
brothers and sisters here who are lifting us up in prayer. I, I shared last night with my wife as I spoke to her uh, the relationships and the refreshment and the prayers that I am uh, experiencing here. And uh, she said she had been praying for my refreshment uh, and that there would be some impartation to you as well. And so I see God answering those prayers and I'm so grateful for it. Um, I do, though I'm just getting to know some of you, I love this church. Uh, and I have tremendous respect for your pastors who are friends and partners in the gospel. Uh, and all of the brothers and sisters at Covenant Fellowship uh, outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, send their love and their greetings to you. Um, it is truly a joy for me to be here. I'd like to invite you to turn to Psalm chapter 8, the book of Psalm chapter 8. And our title today is, is the question of self-image. Psalm 8 is a psalm that deals with what it means to be God's creation, what it means to be made in his image, how we are to view man in light of that fact. And one of the implications of it is for how we are to view ourselves. I want us to consider and explore this issue, which is one that I've been reflecting on quite a bit recently. And so this is Psalm 8. Let's read God's holy and authoritative word. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. May God bless the preaching of his word. I did, uh, I did some research in preparation for this message uh, on the subject of selfies. Uh, I researched selfies. I have to confess the extent of my academic research was limited to Wikipedia, uh, which is not exactly a bastion of reliability. Uh, but there was one article that uh, on Wikipedia that mentioned a study from 2013 finding that selfies account for 30% of pictures taken by those aged 18 to 24. So 30% of photos, selfies. A lot of people uh, blast selfies as being inherently narcissistic. So when Oxford Dictionaries announced selfie as their word of the year in 2013, they said it could be argued that the use of the IE suffix helps to turn an essentially narcissistic enterprise into something rather more endearing. There was another article that I read entitled Selfies Just as Much for the Insecure as Show-Offs, and it explores the ways that, that selfies can be used uh, as a way uh, to, to bring, you know, for, for reassurance for those who struggle to, to embrace who they they are. And then, of course, sometimes, uh, you know, you think you're overthinking it. A selfie can just serve the simple purpose of updating uh, friends on your activities and where you are. I did learn in this uh, research uh, about the ugly selfie, which I didn't even know is a thing, but it was an article by Rachel Hills entitled, Ugly is the New Pretty, How Unattractive Selfies Took Over the Internet. Here's a quote. Posting intentionally unattractive selfies has also become common, in part for their humor value, 
but in some cases also to explore issues of body image or as a reaction against the perceived narcissism or over-sexualization of typical selfies. I'm intrigued by the phenomenon of selfies, and the reason I share this with you is because it touches on the question of self-image. It touches on this question of how we are to view ourselves. How are Christians, in particular, supposed to feel about themselves? You can put the, the problem this way if you want. We know something is not quite right with the person who regularly posts, you know, the, the pouty, duck-faced selfies, hashtag beautiful, hashtag love yourself. At the same time, we know that there's something wrong with a gloomy picture with hashtags ugly and I hate myself. You might be thinking, I know the answer. It's for all of us to stop taking selfies. You know, you might have a point there. Um, I saw a video recently of someone running around New York City uh, with like large printing clippers just snapping all the selfie sticks in half. Kind of funny. Uh, but my purpose in sharing this is, is, uh, is in fact not to bash selfies. In fact, um, this was a subject that I shared uh, with Covenant Fellowship Church, my home church on, and that morning uh, I posted a selfie of myself on Instagram in honor of this uh, very theme that we are considering. My goal is not to bash selfies and selfie sticks. I'm interested in this idea of self-perception uh, because God is interested in this idea of self-perception, and we want to consider and we need to know what the Bible teaches about how we are to regard ourselves as those who are created by him, as those who are made in his image. It is not easy to think rightly about ourselves. The presence of sin in this world has greatly affected the way that we tend to view ourselves. There are voices inside of us and voices all around us that tell us either you are the center of the universe or you have no value in this world. In other words, it's either self-love or self-hatred. We are either uh, narcissists, who is the, the, the proud, uh, self-loving uh, young man in Greek mythology known for his good looks. You may remember he sees his reflection in the water and thinking that it's another creature, he falls in love with it. Uh, finally, he has met someone else as attractive as he is in his own reflection, and he is unable to take his eyes off of himself in that reflection in the water, and he eventually drowns as a victim of his own self-love. The character Narcissus is where we get the word narcissism, uh, which is a fixation on oneself and one's physical appearance, and sadly, we can all identify with narcissism, and indeed it is a problem that is rampant in our day and age. At the same time, we are on the other extreme. We are like, best example I can come up with, Dobby, uh, the endearing house elf character in Harry Potter. He is helpful, he's loyal, but he regards himself as worthless. He, he regards himself as, quote, the dregs of the magical world, and he lacks self-respect. Uh, he constantly experiences unnecessary guilt. He's been badly mistreated by his former owners, and that abuse contributes to his inability to view himself as a complete individual, to view himself as someone who has any dignity or any worth. Uh, he is cruel to himself. He has an impulse to hurt himself himself. Uh, Dobby irons his hands and he shuts his ears in the oven door. He regularly chides himself by saying, bad Dobby, bad Dobby. He speaks of himself in the third person because uh, he doesn't have any sense of self-identity. It is a picture of self-hatred and self-abuse and self-degradation. John talked earlier about the darkness and depression that can come to us. What do we do when those dark thoughts are focused on ourselves, uh, when we would rather be anyone else than the person that God has made us to be. What we see here in Psalm 8 is that, that being made in the image of God, as every one of us are made in the image of God, that's something that confronts both self-infatuation and self-injury. 
And it's something that points us to a better way. This psalm is a psalm of praise. It's a psalm of wonder. It's drawing from the creation account in Genesis 1 and 2. The psalmist doesn't overlook the presence of evil. So you can see in verse 2, there is the mention of foes. Indeed, as we sang, we do have foes in this world. The enemy, the avenger is mentioned there. And yet the accent of this psalm is, is placed on this joyful celebration of the the glory of God revealed in creation. Someone said that Psalm 8 is Genesis 1, 26 through 28 set to music. Those verses are where we learn that men and women have been made in the likeness and image of God. Psalm 8 is that truth set to music. And the psalmist we see is absolutely amazed. He is humbled. He is filled with joy when he learns to view himself and indeed all of humanity, including himself, according to God's perspective. When he comes to see himself as one who is loved by God, one who is made in the image of God, he learns to humbly and to joyfully embrace his dignity. And here God teaches us to do the same. There is a degree of self-knowledge that is absolutely essential to living the Christian life. The only alternative to self-knowledge is self-ignorance or self-deception. Uh, and so the Christian life necessarily involves believing certain things about who we are and, and seeing ourselves as God sees us. Anthony Hokima says this, uh, the Christian life involves not just believing something about Christ, which we must indeed embrace, which we must believe. Christ died, Christ rose again, Christ will return. We must believe these glorious and essential truths about the person and work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. But he says the Christian life involves not only believing something about Christ, but also believing something about ourselves. We must believe that we are indeed part of Christ's new creation. Our faith in Christ must include believing that we are exactly what the Bible says we are. So what I want to do, let's look at four affirmations that we can make about ourselves in light of Psalm 8. Okay, four affirmations. Uh, I've worded these in terms of my and I, that every one of us might be able to say it regarding ourselves. First, my identity is found by looking outward. My identity is found by looking outward. This psalm begins with a reflection on the majesty of God and, and the glory of the night sky. In verse 1, uh, we see God's covenant name, Yahweh, that all caps, Lord, O oh Lord, that's Yahweh, our Lord, you are our God, the one who has saved us. How majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. And what's in view there is what comes later in verse 3. The, the psalmist is out taking in the glory of the night sky taking in the moon and the stars in all of its glory. In other words, to put it negatively, he's not looking inward. He is looking upward. He is looking outward. And it's as he looks at the stars and the moon, as he looks at who this God is, it is then that his own identity comes into focus. And that matters because we live in a world that says self-knowledge and self-discovery and self-actualization come as we look at ourselves, as we look inward. But what if we come to know ourselves best, not by looking inward, but by looking outward? This is, in fact, what Richard Lynn says. He says, the irony of identity is that by looking away from ourselves, we are more likely to discover our identity. In, uh, in the movie Born Identity, Jason Bourne, he's a CIA agent played by Matt Damon, suffered severe amnesia. He's trying to figure out who he is. He's been rescued from the Mediterranean Sea by a crew of men on an Italian fishing boat, and he doesn't know who he is. All he knows is that he can do all of these incredible things. He starts doing chin-ups, tying complex note, uh, knots with rope, asking himself who he is in German and in French and in English. There's one scene later where uh, Bourne is driving with his friend Marie and he turns to her in desperation and says, I don't know who I am or where I am going. And throughout the whole movie and the series, this is one of the major themes of it, uh, this, this search for identity. And one of the striking things is that 
uh, Bourne knows that he will not find the answer to his identity by looking inside himself. He doesn't have the answers here. He can lock himself in a room. He can journal all he wants. He will never come up with the answers. To know himself, he must move beyond himself. And so it is with us. To know ourselves, we must look outside of ourselves. And ultimately, the most important things that we need to know, our, to know about ourselves are found not by looking at ourselves, but by looking to Christ. Think of it this way. Colossians 2 verse 2 says that all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. Knowledge and wisdom about life, about this world, and about ourselves is found in Christ. If all of the treasures and, and, uh, of wisdom and knowledge are found in Christ, we can expect that it's in looking to Christ that we would come to know the most important things that God wants us to know about ourselves. And this is indeed the case. The world has pursued self-understanding by looking inward. God has destroyed the wisdom of the wise, opening our eyes to Christ, and in doing so, teaching us who we really are. In Christ, we see our dignity because he would have never given his life to rescue us unless we were made in the image of God. In Christ, we see our sin because it was my sin that held him there. It was the sins that we have committed and are committing and will commit that require divine judgment. And so we come to see ourselves as sinners in need of a savior. And in Christ, we see our new identity. When we're tempted to think that our sin is what defines us most deeply, we remember that if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. In Christ, we see our value. Because the death he died argues that Christians are deeply cherished by God and of great importance to him. The cross reminds us that that the least and most sinful of God's children are more valuable to him than anything in the world. In Christ, we see our destiny because 1 John 3, 2 says, we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we will see him as he is. This is our identity. Our identity is found, as the psalmist knows, by looking outward, by looking to the night sky, yes, and by looking to the Lord. My identity is found by looking outward. Second, the image of God humbles and exalts me. The image of God humbles and exalts me. Uh, we, we have been, all of us, all people, created with a special connection with God for the purpose of being a special reflection of God. This is what it means to be made in the image of God. You are made, uh, no matter what you believe about God, no matter whether or not you are a Christian, you are made with a special connection with God, a, a relationship. Sometimes people talk about becoming a Christian in terms of having a relationship with God. It might be better to say that you have a loving relationship with God because there's a sense in which all people have a relationship with God. Some just don't know it. And the question is whether that relationship is one of enmity and hostility as those who are abandoning the reason they were made and abandoning the God who made them or whether it is a relationship of love and of grace. But there's a sense in which every one of us has a, a relationship with God, a connection to God, either of, of love or of enmity. We've been created with a special connection with God for the purpose of being a special reflection of God, and that's what it means to be made in his image. And uh, what we see in scriptures, that's something that simultaneously humbles us and exalts us. Look at verses 3 and 4. We see something of the humbling that ought to take place here in our hearts and in our lives when we see ourselves rightly and humble ourselves before the Lord and Creator. When I look at the heavens, in other words, when I look at the vastness of the created world, when I consider the power and the glory of the Creator, when I look to the heavens, what is man? In other words, it is in looking at the stars, that I see the massive difference between God and between humankind. The universe is absolutely massive. God is glorious, and I am so tiny. God is independent. I am dependent. 
God is uncreated. I am created. God is the center of the universe. I am not the center of the universe. God is self-sustaining. And I am reliant upon him for every breath, for every thought, for every movement, for every word. All of it is sustained by God. And therefore, we are humbled before him. What makes an image to be an image is that it is dependent upon the original. And every one of us is dependent upon God. And indeed, the people of God are those being referenced in verse 2, where it speaks of out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have established strength. This is who we are before the holy, sovereign creator and Lord of all. And we humble ourselves and we are brought low because we are dependent, because we are created. And so each one of us must acknowledge our creator and humble ourselves before him. The image of God brings us low. At the same time, uh, verses five through eight, is where we see uh, humanity's God-given place in the created order is one of glory and honor and dominion. Look at these, these verses. We, uh, we have been given astonishing dignity, exalted and ruling over God's creation. Verse 5, yet you made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, which could be a reference there in the original either to uh, angelic hosts or even to God himself. You made him a little lower than heavenly beings and Christ crowns him with glory and honor. What do we need to know about ourselves? You have been crowned with glory and honor. In fact, I, I recommend doing this as, as an exercise and apply this to yourself. Reflect on the most beautiful, majestic parts of creation. Uh, consider the most staggering wonders of the world. Some of you are just thinking of things only in Texas. I won't argue with that. All right, think of the most glorious things that God has made. And then take this truth, consider this. You and I are more like our creator than any of those things. You and I are more glorious and more beautiful and more majestic than any of those things. Human beings are the most beautiful and extraordinary things in the world. And the most glorious thing about us is our relationship to God. Every human being is in the image of God, and therefore every human being is breathtakingly stunning. And this sense of glory and honor is something that we need to promote in each other. And Christians should be leading the way in this. One dad said that he reminds his kids every night. Uh, this, is, uh, this was Scott Sauls who mentioned this in his book, Jesus Outside the Lines. It's a great book. He says that he tucks his kids in at night and has a sort of liturgy that he reminds them of. He says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God so loved you that he gave his son for you. God made you beautiful and special and he loves you very much. And so does your daddy. And he says he does that because his kids are inclined to forget their fundamental identity as image bearers. And they live in a world in which so many voices are bombarding them and telling them they are less valuable than they really are. There's a, a woman in, in Pennsylvania named Miho Khan. She's a performance artist who does uh, one-person shows all over the world. Um, and her story is one of honesty and a story of struggling. It's also a story of hope and redemption. Uh, Miho grew up knowing the challenges of self-hatred. Listen to one thing that she wrote. She said, in the house where I grew up, physical beauty was paramount. My mother was a model when she was a young woman living in Japan in the time right after World War II. My sister was working at a modeling agency by the time she was 16, so the pressure was on. When you grow up in a house of models, one thing you feel you need to be is very, very skinny. I was not skinny. I was normal, maybe even a little chunky. This was unacceptable. And she says she grew up in a culture where one's weight uh, ultimately tied to their beauty, which defined their worth. And growing up, she had a serious eating disorder involving constant binging and purging. She got caught up in drugs and violence. She had an unplanned pregnancy. She dropped out of high school. She left home without a word when she was 16 years old. And she has struggled uh, with herself and with her view of herself for most of her life. I wonder, can you relate to any part of her struggle? And here's what we need to know, brothers and sisters. If, 
if you feel worthless, if you have engaged in self-destructive thoughts and behaviors, oh, I have prayed to God that you would hear the voice of our loving Father spoken over you today and his truth, that it, would, that it would echo in your soul, that it would reach home to your heart, that you would know that no matter what your feelings say, God's word says that he has crowned you with glory and honor, that this is most deeply who you are. And if those are your struggles, tell a parent, tell a trusted friend, tell someone and pray that God would help you to see yourself rightly, to view yourself with a sense of humility and a sense of dignity, to live like you are loved by Christ, because that is exactly what you are. You are more loved by our Savior than you know. John Bloom wrote an article called Lay Aside the Weight of Low Self-Image. Uh, his main point, and hear this out because I'll, I'll explain it. His main point is that what our world often calls low self-image, he says, I think the Bible would say is just another way of thinking too highly of ourselves. And what he says, and this is a helpful paradigm for the Christian life, uh, in this article, you can find it online, John Bloom, Lay Aside the Weight of Low Self-Image. He says there are holy and unholy ways of thinking highly of yourself. Okay, so there's a right way and a wrong way to think highly of yourself. At the same time, there are holy and unholy ways of thinking lowly of yourself. Um, thinking of yourself highly in the right way means knowing that you are created in God's image. We must know as Christians that we are adopted and loved by a father who sings over us. We are sanctified in Christ who died and rose for us. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit who is empowering us, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. That's the right way to think highly of yourself. And God's way to think lowly of yourself is to consider yourself the foremost of sinners and to consider others more important than yourself. There is a right way to think lowly about yourself. Uh, John Bloom then says this, but if you suffer from a chronic sense of failure, underachievement, and shame, because compared to others, you just are not smart enough, competent enough, gifted enough, organized enough, educated enough, successful enough, rich enough, or prominent enough, you struggle with that. He says that is almost always an unholy lowliness. So here's the thing. Uh, thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought, thinking wrongly in the highway of ourselves, that's a, that's a wrong, proud way to think. But also, thinking of ourselves as worthless and hating ourselves is not to be mistaken as humility. Um, if I compare myself to those I consider more gifted or better looking or whatever, and then I'm feeling bad about myself, uh, that becomes an expression of pride. If I consider myself as having no worth, though it looks like weakness, though it can even look like humility, I am in fact standing in opposition to the biblical teaching regarding God's creation and regarding who I am. Both are distorted views of ourselves that are, that are proud refusals to believe what God's word has spoken about who we are. And so the image of God humbles and exalts us at the same time. Third affirmation that we make about ourselves. The God of the universe is mindful of me. The God of the universe is mindful of me. And I've touched on this some, but we need to give verse four a bit more attention. I love verse four. And we need to give this verse attention because of what is revealed here of God's heart for us. Verse four, let this truth wash over your soul today, brothers and sisters. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Uh, mindful. God is mindful of man. What does that mean? Not just that he notices us, but as that next line explains, that he cares for us. In other words, as we think about the greatness of God, don't take the greatness of God to mean that he is distant from you. Rather take his greatness to mean he is so great that he is aware of every detail in your life and he is intimately involved in everything that concerns you. He cares about your situation. He takes action on your behalf. He loves you. 
John Piper says this, the Imago Dei, that's the image of God. The Imago Dei is that in man which constitutes him as he whom God loves. Made in the image of God, loved by God. We naturally think, I doubt that the creator of this massive and glorious universe cares about me. Little tiny me, because I am a nobody. I am small and insignificant. And you look at your life and it doesn't seem like you're doing anything meaningful. You feel like you have no gifts. It may feel like you're overlooked by others. Maybe even at church and among Christians, you feel like you are outside of, of some uh, connection in the church. Uh, maybe you come and, and no one says hi or no one moves toward you or people that you want to befriend are not uh, responsive and affectionate toward you. You can at times doubt that anyone would miss you if you were gone. Here's the, here's the question to consider because we will be mistreated by others and there will be times in life where we are rejected by others wrongly. The question to consider and the question that we always fall back on at those times and in those struggles, what does God feel when he looks at you in Christ? And there's perhaps no better answer to that than Zephaniah 3.17 that says, He rejoices over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love, and he will exalt over you with loud singing. The God who made you loves you. He enjoys you. He rejoices over you in Christ. And that is the most important thing that you must know about yourself, that you must embrace about yourself even today. You are an object of the Lord's affection. He gave his son for you. You are precious. You are honored in his sight. You are among the people whom God declares to be his bride and a most rare jewel. God looks at you in Christ and says, this is Isaiah 43 verse 4, you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. Write it on your heart, write it on the walls, write it on the mirror, whatever you think when you Look into it. Isaiah 43, 4, the voice of God, you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. And, and know today that that is not dependent upon your performance or your obedience because there's nothing in us that can explain God valuing us and being mindful of us. See, we tend to base the way that we feel about ourselves on our appearance or our performance, our ability to measure up against others. And we look for value inside of ourselves, in my gifts, in my attainments. And that produces incredible fear and anxiety in life. But it's in those moments that Christ comes to us. He draws near to us. He reassures the children of God that, that we are, in fact, more valuable than we know. And that our value is grounded securely in the unchanging reality of being cared for, protected, and loved by our Heavenly Father. He says in Matthew 10, beginning in verse 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. And so we learn that Christ does not break a bruised reed. He is so tender and gentle with us, even when we handle ourselves more harshly than we should. Praise God for Jesus Christ. The God of the universe is mindful of me. And our last and final point, the affirmation that we make, I was made for a glorious future in Christ. I was made for a glorious future in Christ. This psalm uh, begins and ends not with man, but with God. If you look at verses 1 and 9, they serve as the repeated bookends of the psalm. And this verse anticipates the consummation of all things and our future in Christ. Because indeed, we look at the world and we see ways in which God's name is not being magnified as it ought to be. And yet the psalmist says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Because he knows that the day is coming when this truth will be fully realized and the name of our Lord, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will most certainly be majestic in all the earth. 
and we as Christians know how that will happen. Um, And this is how, though we were, as verse six says, given dominion over the works of God's hands and have had all things put under our feet, we have sinned greatly. We have failed in the dominion we were given as God's image bearers. All things were put under our feet. We were given rule and dominion, but in Adam, we failed to carry that out. Christ then came into this world and did what we could not do. He succeeded where we failed that we might one day rule as God originally intended. And in fact, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul uses this same exact language here of all things under his feet there in verse 6. He uses that language to refer to Christ. Um, Perhaps you remember in Ephesians 1, verse 22, it says, God put all things under his feet, under Christ's feet. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 25, for Christ must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The author of Hebrews, in fact, put this most beautifully. He quotes Psalm 8 in Hebrews 2, beginning in verse 6, to show that Christ is the perfect representation of humanity, that Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of Psalm 8, that Christ is the one who is in view here. Jesus Christ is the ideal human being, the, the prototypical man who was crowned with glory and honor after his suffering for our sins. This is Hebrews 2, beginning in verse 6. Listen to this. It has been testified somewhere. uh, That's Psalm 8, we know. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now listen to this. This is continuing in Hebrews 2. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. That's Christ. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. No, we do not. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angel. So now using this language of being made a little lower than heavenly beings in verse five of Psalm eight to refer to the incarnation, we see him who was made a little lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor, again, Psalm eight, because of his suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Christ has come into this world. He has succeeded indeed where we have failed and where we could not succeed. And through his death and resurrection and reign, he has secured this future for us. The reign and the hope that we were made for. This is your future in him. This is the future that we were made for. We were given glorious dominion in the beginning, and for those in Christ, that rule will one day be even more glorious. The day is surely coming when we will see everything in subjection to Jesus Christ. Is it your life now? No. Do we look around us now and see everything in subjection to him? in the news and in politics and in our lives and in our families? No, we don't. But the day is surely coming when we will see everything, everything in subjection to Jesus Christ. On that day, we will be victorious over death. On that day, we will rule. On that day, we will judge angels. And though now we shine dimly, one day we will shine like the sun. Jaws will drop and all of creation will sing for joy at the revealing of the children of God. Romans 8, 19, among whom you are numbered by grace. Jonathan Edwards says that in heaven, we will forever increase in beauty. That's where you're going. That's where you are headed. Those who have trusted in Christ, those who are united to him. And that view of where we're headed needs to inform our view of ourselves here and now. You were made for a glorious future in Christ. You are even now being transformed from one degree of glory to another. 2 Corinthians 3.18. You are, God says, a new self. Colossians 3.10. A new self that is being renewed after the image of its creator. In other words, broken mirrors are being fixed. His love is making us lovely. 
Jesus makes all things new. And therefore, when we come to see who we are and what God has done, we praise the Lord. See, nowhere does the psalmist say, and this is what the self-esteem movement gets wrong, I praise me for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. But the psalmist does say, I praise you, Lord, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And it has been my prayer for you that it would all and humble us today to be loved by a God so high and that you would rest today in the love of God in Christ, that you would rest your soul in knowing that the creator of the universe is mindful of you and cares for you more than you know. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's pray together. Father, we do come before you now, humbled with our hearts bowed down before you. You are glorious and majestic, and we stagger and marvel that you are mindful of us and that you care for us. God, would you lift the darkness from us? Would you save us from self-infatuation and self-injury? Would you teach us to see ourselves as you see us and to live as those who are forever loved and treasured in Christ? We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.